So it's my pleasure to welcome E.E. E. Tai, and she will tell us about stochastic error cancellation in analog quantum simulations. Hello. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm E.E. E. Tai. Today I'm presenting our work on stochastic error cancellation in analog quantum simulations. This is a joint work with Yu Tone and John Presco at Caltech. So to start off, as we all know, quantum computers can more efficiently simulate quantum uh, systems compared to best known classical algorithms. A simple example is that we can see the exponential speed up in space and time when we want to simulate a 2D Heisenberg model when we, uh, under the assumption that each qubit is noiseless. Compared to its uh, digital counterparts, uh, the analog quantum processors do not need uh, local control gates to perform uh, informative simulations. So what does this mean? This means that in the analog case, um, unfortunately, compared to the, the gate-based uh, digital quantum processors, it's less versatile. It can do less things. Um, this also means we cannot implement error correction on this platform. However, on the positive side, uh, these processors are also less susceptible to error. So between the digital and analog uh, quantum processors, we see a trade-off between um, versatility and susceptibility to errors. Uh, therefore, it's very important for us to address the following question in the analog setting. Uh, that is, what are the prospects for reaching quantum advantage using near-term quantum simulators that are not error corrected? Specifically, it's very important for us to analyze how errors accumulate in this analog setting. So recently, Trevity et al. Um, provided one of the first uh, analytical results in um, error scaling in the analog setting. And what they did specifically is showing that local observable errors scales independently of system size, which is a really nice result. So our work directly built on top of their result. This is a brief summary of our contributions. First, we have a slightly different assumption of our um, local perturbations. So the local perturbations we have are assumed to be stochastic and statistically independent between the actual and uh, target Hamiltonian. So with this assumption, we're able to obtain the following results, which are improved observable error bounds that hold with large probability. Specifically, for any arbitrary observable, we are able to show an improved, a quadratic improved scaling uh, of square root of number of qubits rather than the previous best case of uh, linear in number of qubits. Next, we also look at this local observable setting in the thermodynamic limit, and we are able to show an almost quadratic improvement. Oops an almost quadratic improvement with respect to time. So we have t to the d over two plus one compared to previous best known result derived by Trevity et al of t to the d plus one. Here, d is a dimension of the physical lattice space that qubits live on. And lastly, applying these results to the fidelity decay setting, we're able to show a non-exponential decay where um, the fidelity decays with respect to um, square root of n uh, rather than linear in n. So this is really nice because we're able to get a non-exponential decay. And lastly, we provided uh, numerical experiments to support these uh, favorable uh, scaling analysis. So before going through the results, I would like to first provide some intuition about how the, those, the cancellation process work. So first, let's assume we have m independent error sources, which essentially are modeling the qubit errors. If we say each qubit or each error source had, uh, follows a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and variance of delta squared, this means that the cumulative error is a total Gaussian error with, again, mean zero, but here, m delta squared variance. This means that the total error has a standard deviation of square root m times delta, which means that on average, we can obtain a, around order of square root m cumulative observable error uh, when the number of error sources uh, goes really large. 
So this means that if we fix the cumulative observable error, uh, we can tolerate more hardware wear error. Um, so a simple numerical example is that if we have X's uh, following a standard Gaussian distribution, and we sum them together uh, with n of them, take their absolute value. You can see this um, kind of uh, square root scaling compared to a generic linear growth in n. So this is a general intuition about how the cancellations work. Next, I will talk about how the analog setting uh, is usually set up. First, consider a Hamiltonian H that we want to implement on a physical hardware. Uh, the problem is when we, this H is uh, implemented on the hardware, there will be some error terms introduced by uh, qubits or sets of qubits. So we ended up implementing some sort of H prime, a perturbed Papatonian um, on the physical platform. So the difference between the ideal and perturbed Hamiltonian are made up of these local terms, uh, which characterize delta, which characterize the local perturbations, and we sum over uh, n, which is all the qubits in the system. Um, so this is a very generic setup for the analog setting. Based on this setup, we have our uh, slide assumption for the local error. So instead of the local error being a constant delta, we make it a uh, a uh, random variable that follows the following uh, distribution. So we define these GI terms that follow what we call a generalized normal distribution, which is uh, also called chi deformed Gaussian. So here are some properties of the, this uh, chi deformed Gaussian uh, that are very useful for our results. First, this is uh, uh, this GI term is in term of a Gaussian. So we're able to generalize it from a Gaussian. Next, we want to re restrict the variance of this random variable, GI, and we want to keep it unbiased. Lastly, we want to make sure it's bounded, just like how physical noise is bounded in a system. So with these assumptions, uh, we're able to um, have uniform distribution over an interval and truncated Gaussian distributions um, as potential distribution that GI can follow, which is uh, really nice. So next, this is our main result. So first, if we have an arbitrary observable O, an ideal Hamiltonian H, we time evolve it and with respect to the initial state uh, row, and we take the trace of it, so we average it over this observable value over time. And we want to see how much this observable value differ when it's under the uh, target Hamiltonian H and the perturbed Hamiltonian H prime. So here, uh, N is the system size. With this bound, uh, which is with the leading order term of square root N, uh, T delta, where delta is a characterization of the local error, we're able to uh, arrive at this Bound. And here, in order to have time scale in which simulation provides meaningful results, we assume the leading order term is less than one. And this is stronger than the previous bound that scales linearly in number of qubits when we assume that the GI terms is just simply a constant, which means that there's no error cancellation. So next, I will provide a br brief uh, sketch of the proof on way how we got to this result. So first, we want to um, sh show that how much the average observable um, differ. So we average over multiple instances of the noise, which is give us um, this expectation value with respect to GI terms. And we want to see how it differs from the ideal Hamiltonian time evolution. Um, here, it's very important that the leading order term is second order rather than first order. So with this result, um, we know, uh, we shows that in order to achieve meaningful results, uh, we only need local perturbation with order of one over square root of n rather than the previous naive result of one over n. Again, quadratic improvement. So now I will provide a brief a sketch of how this proof works. Uh, quick reminder: this is how we relate the h prime and h with the GI expressions. 
Next, we use interaction picture to relate the time evolution under the ideal Hamiltonian and the perturbed Hamiltonian. Then we perform Dyson expression. Um, so we get all of these um, time ordered integrals. Um, and then we take expectation value first with respect to rho, the initial state, then average over GI. The key part though of this long expression is this expectation value part, where because the way we define this GI as the chi deform Gaussian with some certain properties, um, if the number of GIs being product is odd, then we have zero. So this is how we get the leading order term to vanish and only have a second order uh, scaling. Now to get to the second part of the proof, uh, the bound initial bound we have, um, we want to prove the uh, square root scaling. So what we want to show is how, the, how much the observable val expectation value can deviate from its average. This is simply a, a direct application of concentration of probability measure. Uh, because the way we define um, GIs is in terms of a Gaussian, uh, this means that we can apply this uh, Gaussian concentration equality for Lipschitz functions. And this gives us um, using a triangle inequality, combining this bound and the previous uh, second order bound, we're able to get our main results uh, with leading order terms, scaling with square root of number of qubit times time times delta. Next, um, we're also very interested in tasks um, that have observable values that scale independent of system size. Um, because these are tasks that analog quantum simulators can conceivably run in the near term. So one um, task of interest is local observable because it itself is independent of system size. So this is how we uh, set up our local observable setting. We consider a spin system with spatial locality with on a D-dimensional lattice with N size in total and L size in each direction. So the system Hamiltonian we use um, is a summation of uh, local terms where each local terms is bounded by some constant and acting on spin um, or on qubits within a certain distance of some uh, center. So now we want to um, essentially apply the Lieb Robinson bound to this uh, local observable setting. I will first provide some intuition on how the Lieber Robinson bound works. So the way this bound works is utilizing the fact that quantum information propagates at some finite speed v. What this means is in a Heisenberg picture on a 1D chain, for example, if we have a zero acting on this qubit in a the center, then as time propagates, we create this light cone structure where only the qubits in the light cone Will have um, uh, will be impacted by the observable um, that was initially at this qubit. So all the qubits that are far from um, these uh, light cone lines um, have um, exponentially small correlations with the initial observable. This is how we achieve an independence of uh, system size for the error scaling, essentially. So applying this Lee Robinson bound, we get to our next result. Um, which is essentially saying that as before the setup, gener uh, here we have a local observable O and a local Hamiltonian H. We have a perturbed Hamilt uh, Hamiltonian H prime, and we show that their error bound um, scales with uh, T to the D over two plus one. Again, just a reminder, D is the dimension of the lattice space. So what this means is that stronger than uh, the previous uh, derived bound of t to the d plus one without the error cancellation case. Again, when gi is uh, simply a constant delta. Um, this is how, in order to use the Lieb Robinson bound, uh, there is some restriction as to the local errors, which is the reason we place the um, physical noise being bounded uh, restriction on when we define the chi deform Gaussian. So here we need to assume that the noise is spread evenly across the system in order to have this result. 
Next, we can also extend our result to the fidelity decay setting. So the way uh, we set up the fidelity is as following. We have some initial state, psi zero. We uh, time evolve it under ideal Hamiltonian H, get to psi of T, and time evolve it against um, under perturbed Hamiltonian H prime, get to psi prime of T, take their inner product and norm squared. This is our uh, metric for fidelity. And our result is as following. The fidelity is lower bounded by the exponential decay with factor of um, that's a, a square root of number of qubits, which is, again, better than the previous bound where the exponent is uh, linear in n. So uh, interestingly, this is also independently experimentally observed by Adam Shaw uh, from Manuel Andres group at Caltech, um, where they had a slightly different setting, but very similar to ours. Um, and they were able to show this um, non exponential uh, fidelity decay experimentally as well on the Atom platform. Lastly, a simple numeric uh, experiment to support the results. This is an 18 qubit system, uh, uh, time evolving under a Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Uh, where we have uh, pairs of uh, interactions, and we measure local observable y on the second qubit. And here, you can see the random error, which is the case with the cancellation, scales better than symmetric error case, which is the case without the error cancellation. So in summary, we showed that under this assumption that random noise, uh, each qubit has a random or stochastic noise, uh, coming from independent sources, we're able to show improved scaling uh, in error bounds because of the error cancellation properties. Specifically, we showed a quadratic improvement in the general observable setting and extended results for system with uh, local interactions and for fidelity decay. Some future directions to further tighten the bounds include uh, thermalization. So when the system thermalizes, um, the state converges to some fixed point, which means the error would accordingly um, eventually um, converge to some very small value as well. Symmetry could, uh, system uh, with symmetry, we can also e more easily detect errors. And lastly, um, in many body localized system, the Lieb Robbins bond actually isn't very tight because of the, it has a slower propagation of information. So for, for this specific case, we can also um, further tighten the bound. So that's the talk. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for the talk. Um, so here you showed these results for a very particular noise model that I understand correctly, like, like with local qubit noise and with these Gaussian distributions. Um, Yes, but the, the assumptions we place are pretty mild in general. You can still think of uh, the noise model being you know, uniform distribution or a Gaussian that's truncated at some point. I see, I see. Because my feeling is that you know, these um, improvements due to error cancellation should happen for like much more generic noise models. But maybe I just misunderstood. Like, does, does your theorem actually uh, work on much milder assumptions? Um, we use the assumption that is chi deformed Gaussian. Uh, which uh, we think encompass much of the natural distributions that can be used to model the system. I see. I see. Uh, so, do you, you suspect that you think that uh, do you suspect that this result can be generalized to like other distributions, maybe not local distributions, non-Gaussian distributions? Yeah, good question. So, um, here our errors come. They don't have to be from individual qubits. It can be in, be from individual sets of qubits. They don't have they can be correlated as long as the correlation is um, decaying exponentially or polynomially with large factors. Um, our results can also extend to um, the setting with a coherent error as well. This is very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, nice. thanks for the talk. Um, I'm wondering if you've thought about uh, lower bounds at all. And in particular, I guess, like, uh, based on the logic that you gave, like, I might hope that the t uh, linear and T could potentially become like square root of T in the sense that like the volume 
all contributes in this like uh, stochastic way? Uh, is that definitely ruled out or? That's a good point. I think it gets pretty complicated when you try to derive lower bounds in these settings. Um, but it's definitely something to look into. Thank you. Uh, so if I understand the model, um, you start with a perturbed Hamiltonian H prime, then you evolve the system according to H prime for some time, then you uh, get another random HI and you do the same procedure and then you average. That's correct. So this H prime itself is made up of random, uh, random variables. It is set in the beginning. And it is it is it stays fixed along the, the coherent time evolution. That's right. The H prime. Yeah. Could you repeat that part? So H prime does not change as you evolve the system in time. I mean, you fix it in the beginning, you evolve it for I don't know for two seconds, and then you repeat again with the new H prime that is drawn from from this Gaussian distribution, and you do it again and again and again, and you get the and you set the average in the end, right? H prime is fixed from the beginning. So. But what makes it physical in that sense? I mean, why wouldn't the uh, the perturbation change in time as well? Well, we think that the H prime could be extended to the time dependent case as well. Um, but the analysis does get more complicated. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a very basic question. Uh, I'm not very familiar with this kind of um um yes type settings. So like, so in your work, like you assume that mean error source is like coherent errors, but like I think in many quantum computers, the mean error source will be like incoherent errors, like depolarizing or like uh, amplitude damping or something like that. So. I was wondering why you assume that the mean error source in your like. Uh, analog simulator is coherent there. So the key part of the proof was the fact that the the in, each individual error source has a zero mean essentially, which give us the uh, leading order term. Vanish. Let's see if... So the main result goes back to the um, this far where if you product together with all numbers of i's, um, or with all number of k's, uh, the expectation value goes to zero. This is uh, from the assumption we place on the local error model. Um, so this is kind of a restriction to have this leading order term vanish. So you mean like you need to assume a coherent error to obtain such kind of relationship? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this nice talk. And so let's thank our speaker again. <laughs>